The RJ45 connector is one of the most common ones you'll find in networking. And that's because this is the connection that's at the end of your Ethernet patch cables. The RJ45 connection is what we call an 8P8C connector. That means it has eight positions and eight conductors. We use all eight of those positions as also conductors in this cable. You can see the little copper conductors that are on this cable. Even if we aren't using every wire inside of an RJ45 connection, we usually will take all of the wires and put them into every single one of those conductors anyway. This is also a modular cable, which means you can easily insert it into a jack and hit a little tab on the top and pull it out of the jack. And while it's in the jack, it's in there pretty well. You have to really press down on that tab to pull it out of that connection. This is different than what we had in the older POTS or the older PSTN telephone networks where there were no modular connections. You had to manually wire everything onto screws and screw them down. But with these RJ type connections, it becomes very easy to plug these in, unplug them, and move them around in any way you'd like. Another common modular connector is the RJ11 connector. We most often see this associated with telephone type connections. You're plugging in a telephone into the wall. It's probably an RJ11 connection that you're looking at. This is what we call a 6P2C connector, which means there are six positions inside of this connector. But we generally only wire two of those wires. And that's because telephone lines only use two wires. Sometimes you'll see all four of those connectors wired. When it is a 6P4C, where we're using four of those conductors, we generally call that an RJ14. It has a different standard associated with it. If you look inside the jack, you see there are only two conductors inside of it. And that's because telephone lines only use those two wires. But what you'll find is when you pick up those telephone cables and look at the end connection, you almost always find that all four of those conductors happen to be punched down and, and crimped inside of that connection. And that's because you might use these same wires for two wire connections for two lines of the telephone so that you can use this one connection to have two telephone lines going through that one cable. It makes it very easy to do it that way. And since most of these cables already have four wires inside of them, we generally punch down both of those pair at one time. A type of connector you don't see very much of any longer is the BNC connection. This stands for a bayonet Neil Councilman. This was created by Paul Neal and Carl Councilman. Paul was with Bell Labs and Carl was with Amphenol. And they created a new connector to be used for Ethernet networking over coax. This was 10 megabit Ethernet back in the early days of ThinNet. And these are these BNC type connections. The bayonet that's on the end of it is associated with this connector that pushes in and you turn so that it locks in place. At least ideally, that's what we would like to have happen. These are probably most often seen on RG58. They're used in TinBase 2, which is that ThinNet Ethernet connectivity. Some of the challenges we have with this type of cabling is that it's very rigid. It's very bulky. You can see it's much bigger than if you were using twisted pair cabling, for instance. And sometimes these connections, even though they are bayonet and they're not supposed to untwist, because they were so big and so clunky, it was very easy to have those pop out. And your whole network would go down, because the thin net had to be one single cable run all the way through the network. And if you had a disconnection anywhere along the way, the entire network would cease to function. Until twisted pair cabling came along, this was one of the most common Ethernet type of topologies we were using, where we had these RG58 thin net cables strung everywhere using these BNC connectors on the end. A type of connection we've had for a very long time, but only recently have we started using it for digital signals, is the F connector. This is the type of connector you might have on a cable television system. So we used to run our analog cable television right into our homes, right into our offices on these cable coax connections. And we'd have these F connectors at the end that would plug into the F connector on your devices. And now we're using these same connections that used to run our analog television signals, now running digital television signals. They're running our internet connectivity. They're running voice communication, all digital, all over these same cables that are coming into our home. And it's that F connector on the end that allows that connectivity for our cable television systems.
if you're using any type of serial connection, maybe you're plugging into a very, very old modem with some legacy equipment, or you're configuring some new equipment with a serial connection that's on your laptop, on your desktop, or on a serial port that's on those devices, then you're probably using a DB9 type serial connection. You may hear this often referred to as an RS-232 connection. That stands for Recommended Standard 232. And as you can see here, it's been a standard for a very long time, since 1969. Serial cabling and the signals that go across are a type of networking we've been doing for a very, very long time. It's usually used for modems. We use it for printers. Sometimes the early mice had serial connections on there that plugged into a serial port on your computer because we didn't have USB connections at that time. We had to find some other type of interface. And prior to USB, a lot of those interfaces into our computers was done with a serial type connection. And even some networks were done this way. And you'll see the serial connections have different sizes associated with them. We'll call these DB9. And that refers to the nine pins that happen to be on this very small connection. If you were to look at the standard, you'll notice that the size of the port itself is associated with the letter DA, DB, DC, DD, and DE. We originally had serial connections that were DB25, and we'd often refer to those. And when the serial connections got much smaller, we used a smaller port for them, this nine pin connection. We use the DB because we were so used to saying it. So these days, when somebody refers to a DB9, they really are referring to this size of connector and nine pins inside of it. But in reality, the standard is actually a DE9. An interesting aside, you'll probably be asked more for a DB9 on your Network Plus exam. But some interesting history is just the changes that we have with the naming conventions that we use. On the back of your computers, you'll probably see the serial port as these male pins coming out the side. They have nine connections associated with them. Don't confuse this with other sizes that look similar, like this video port. You'll notice there are 15 pins inside of that. That's your VGA connection. That is not a serial connection. And one way that you can easily tell is that one happens to be a female connection, and one happens to be a male connection. And it is that DB9 mail connection port that's on these systems that we most often associate with a configuration port these days. We aren't really plugging in modems any longer. We're not plugging in mice to these serial connections. In fact, on some machines, it's hard to even find a serial port like this on the newer systems. So we very often have to plug in a USB connection that has a DB9 serial connection on the end of it, just so we can plug into a router or plug into a firewall or plug into a switch and make our configuration changes on those devices. If you've been in a data center, you've been in a wiring closet, you may have seen these 110 blocks, these standardized blocks that are used for punching down all of the wires. These are used whenever you would run wires from one location to another. Maybe you're in the data center, and you're running a lot of wires out to another floor of the building so that you can extend the network connections all the way out to those floor where your users might be. And on both sides of those wires, instead of having the wires just there and, and hanging down from where you have run them, you punch all of those wires into what we call the standard 110 block. And so on both sides, you have a standardized way of connecting all of your devices into these blocks. There's no extra interfaces in between. We really now have extended one side to the other and put these standard connections on each side. We then will take the wires that we've strung and we'll punch them down into the block. And if you look very closely inside of this block are tiny little pieces of metal, tiny connectors and conductors that grab onto, essentially cut into the insulation around that all the way down to the copper so that you have a good signal between those two connections. And then you would put another tiny little block on top that you would punch down other wires, which would, would effectively create a connection between those two. That way you're able to take other devices, plug them into the top of this particular block, and now you've made a connection from one room to the other room all through these punch down blocks. You use these tools, which is a punch down tool, to make that connection. It's pushing the wire into the block. It's cutting off any of the excess wire that you might have there. And it's getting far enough into the block that the block is now able to get into the insulation and connect with the copper conductors there. Sometimes it's very loud when you're taking this tool. You really are punching it down, which is is why we call it a punch down block. Instead of having a punch down block where you are punching down your original wires, putting another connection on the top, and punching down the wires that are going to connect to it, you might just bypass that and make it a little bit more modular. On both sides, you might punch down all of your wires onto a patch panel. 
you're, you can see in this particular case, you have a patch panel that has those 110 type connectors right on the top. We'll punch down the wires in this room. We'll extend the cables out to a floor. And we'll have the same patch panel perhaps on the other side and punch down the connectors there. At that point, I have modular connectors. And that way, I can simply plug in Ethernet patch cables and perhaps plug it into a switch on one side in my data center. And on the other side where the floor is, I can simply connect devices directly to these and extend that all the way from one side to the other. Makes it very fast to make changes. I can now move things around whenever I need to. There's not a lot of punching down or moving of wires. I can simply use these modular RJ45 connectors and connect any device on my floor to any port that's inside of my data center.